Hey, I'm going to be reading an article about the Unit 731. I just finished recording it, and this is going to open up with a about seven and a half minute introduction to where I'm at, why I'm reading this, kind of setting it up, and then gets into the actual reading of it. I think it's worth listening to that 731 first. If you want to jump straight to the article, I'll put a mark of where it starts. But this is Unit 731, which was a unit in World War II, a Japanese unit that was involved in some really horrific experimental warfare and experiments on war prisoners and things like that that some of you may not have heard of. I think it's as bad as anything that you could, that went on during World War II, and there were some horrific things that went on there. But why do you hear about certain things? Why are certain things not talked about? Why do people even do these things? What do you feel about these things? And that's just some things I'm bringing up into this, getting into the video now. I'd be remiss not to mention this. This is the title of the article I'm going to be reading. Inside Unit 731, World War II, Japan's Sickening Human Experience Program. It is actually sickening. There's some really gruesome material, so adult content warning, adult mentality required. If you are squeamish, if you aren't squeamish, some of this stuff is horrific to hear about. So there's a warning with that. Hi. Today I'm going to be reading about Unit 731, which is something that... It's, it's a horrific story. When I first heard of it, I, I was a bit taken aback that I hadn't heard of this before. Heard about this rather recently. It was probably a few years back when I first heard. When Okay, I have a, a separate video about how white racism, white slavery is always going to be the worst kind of slavery, probably until there is some other major slavery, which I think as a human species we are beyond and we won't get back to that kind of level. There would have to be a lot to happen for us to get back to the point where we dehumanize each other to the point where we think owning each other is a possible thing. You look at even the certain more contemporary religions and all that kind of sorts that are being developed now, and they don't include that. Even something like Scientology, for example, takes that out of there, yet you go back to Mormonism and that has the dehumanization of people. So even people who are thinking about beings that would create the entire world are already getting to a situation where they say, okay, at least all the humans have the ability to be equal and possessing other humans in this sense is not in, like inherently saying we have different tiers of humans where some are subhuman and can be owned like animals is not the thing we do anywhere. And I'm not saying Scientology is better. And I think there's good, there might be some of this. And just even this open already, this digression from going to talking about this Unit 731, is it goes to show because this content itself, I talked to somebody about making this video and I was like, this is some horrific stuff. And it makes me, I don't, I don't really like delving into this material so much because it gets in your mind and it's material you know but i think it's important i am a fan of japan japanese culture manga anime and things like that the video games i'm a big fan of that i'm somewhat fascinated with the eastern kind of um societies of these shame cultures of skilled cultures there's certain things about the way the country is certain things about it are somewhat unique and somewhat um attractive to me that that get my interest but one of my early videos on this channel was about they literally mean figuratively when they were talking about uh, how somebody says genocide now. They say, oh, there's a white genocide going on or, oh, there's a war on women going on or, oh, black people are being oppressed in this kind of way. What they actually mean when they're talking about genocide or war or oppression is a figurative sense. They're not literally talking about this. And I use an example of the Rwandan, um, Rwandan genocide and saying that was a term, it was, I think it started with the Armenian Genocide, and that kind of targeted killing of people had not been done before. They had to invent a word for it, and that word now has changed to just someone is, I'm slightly offended by these people not paying attention to a group I feel I'm a part of. Now that means there's some kind of active battle against me. These words kind of change, and I was talking about how that happened. That was a genocide, the Armenian Genocide. I was talking about how the Rwandan Genocide was a genocide, clearly. I was talking about how the rape on Nanking was a genocide, even though that was Jap Japan, a much smaller um, number of people eradicating certain groups of Chinese people in Nanking, even though the majority of the Chinese people still stayed alive. So you can have a targeted, um, you can have a targeted genocide of a relative minority of people 
attacking a subsection of a bigger group and because of the nature of the attack, that's what happens. So it's talking about that, talking about how some things are not found out. You don't find out about these other things. Rape on Nanking is definitely not as televised, not as publicized, even as something like the Rwandan genocide. And then going back to the slavery thing I was talking about, I was talking about how with that, uh, slavery is different because with white slavery, the um, transatlantic slavery that the, it was done from the Americas from, to the New World from Western Africa, that was publicized a lot more than any other forms of slavery. There's books about it, there's films being made, there's recounting of it. They're, they, the people right now, the descendants of those people constantly talk about this actual event. And that makes it a lot more visceral and visual into our minds. Now, when we think of slavery, that's kind of the imagery that comes with it because that's what has been pumped out. And I think that's a positive thing because it makes that culture also very aware of it. And even though some people say there's white guilt that shouldn't be felt and they say this, that, and this, and that other about it, but some of those same people who say we have no white guilt because that's something ancestors ago, multiple centuries ago, again, yeah, hundreds of years ago, multiple generations ago, a few of us did that thing. So we're not going to be responsible for that as white guilt. But those very same white people will look even further back to fewer white people that they have even lesser relation with that might have been in Europe or somewhere else and say, because that one person invented this one thing, that means I'm proud about my white heritage because of that. So there is some dichotomy with that, but people have that nature. So when I look at a country like, like, um, or like Germany and they say, okay, the amount of... The amount of knowledge that they must have or the feeling and the culture, the cultural identity they must have, having people still alive that were actual Nazis, actually during the, during the whole situation, during the whole homicide, during the whole, during the whole Holocaust, there's people alive still right now in Germany who were alive during that time. So that guilt is still there, that shared guilt, that feeling like we are a part of this. And you can feel pride from that group in that sense, that collective pride. You can also feel the correct collective guilt and the collective burden where you feel, and I think I would be, <laughs> I think I'm safe to say most of the people think it was a horrific thing that was done. And most of the people even during that time didn't know how bad it was, but it's still there. So if they can be proud about their Germanic heritage going further back from that time or anything that was coexisting at that time, they also have to take the guilt of that. So that's tough in certain places. How do you hold that? People see the white guilt in the United States of America and there's a lot of done, there's a lot has been done back to try and uh, readdress those grievances and readdress those problems and kind of respond to that in sense of reparations and other things, which I'm not going to discuss. I don't think they're that effective, but I would like to hold people as individuals, but that's for something else. Anyway, talking about that has been done. So what's being done in these other countries to kind of redress those situations? Now, in a place like Japan, they also have that kind of thing. I think they even have a stronger, more um, insular, more homogeneous kind of society. So they have this too. How do they feel about the things that they were doing that were during World War II? How much is it talked about that way? Already you have the whole, I've grown up in Western cultures in Europe, in uh, Kenya. It's, uh, it's been a colony of uh, England. So um, it's, it's westernized. I lived in the United States of America. So I've seen different Western cultures and gotten some kind of idea of that. But the Eastern culture, how different is that mindset? How is it? How do they approach something like the rape of Nanking? How do they approach the actual horrors that happened during the World War? How do they approach something like Unit 731? Do they take this in the same way that the Germans would about the things that happened during the Holocaust? Because I've been aware of this. I'm going to read this article, um, this article in particular, but I've heard about this thing before and some really horrific stuff in this. So is this taught in schools? Do people know about this? Is it hushed down? Have you heard of this before? But I'm just going to get into the reading now. I'll try to read at least a paragraph before I give any thoughts. I might try to just read it all the way through and then come back to some thoughts at the end, but let's just get right into it. Inside Unit 731, World War II, Japan's Sickening Human Experiments Program. This is by Richard Stockton and published on November 2nd of 2017, and it's on allthatsinteresting.com. So six of the most disturbing experiments conducted by Unit 731, the gruesome biological and chemical warfare research unit of the Imperial Japanese Army. And then there's a picture here of Unit 731, 
You read 731 or 731 personnel conduct a bacteriological trial upon a test subject in Nongang County of Northeast China's Jilin province um, in November 1940. It's um, someone looks like in a lot of pain on some kind of tarp, some buckets there, and they're spraying something on on the person. Okay. World War II was beyond horrible for hundreds of millions of people. It's as if all the developed countries of the world had surplus rage and hate that they had been storing up, and it all came flooding out in the war years. Out of all the areas in which World War II was fought, none were, act, none were active as long as, would, as what would come to be known as the Pacific Theater. In fact, Japan arguably started the war by attacking Manchuria in 1931, and it inarguably waged war with China by invading in 1937. The disturbances and upheavals at the, that these inv invasions caused shook China to its very foundations, triggered a civil war and a famine that probably killed more people than currently live in Canada and Australia combined and lasted until the, counties, the country's Soviet liberation in 1945. So this is this something about how interconnected some of these things, and I think it, it, you'll do yourself a disservice of your awareness of how the world is. We're talking about globalization. Oh, people think it's such a new thing and such a terrible thing. And I think the positives of it, I am more pro-positive globalization in the sense that getting to know each the world, getting to know each other as a human species in that sense. But even before that, before that aspect of having the technology and awareness to be actually in contact and travel to and see about and get to know other people in other places and other locations and have it identified as part of who you are as a person in your day-to-day -day life. I'm not talking about just, oh, you just have an idea of what Antarctica is, but you actually have it as when you think I am from the world, you actually have all these other places in your mind. It's, it's a different concept. And I think I, I don't know how to relate it with some people. Maybe some people in the United States of America, if you haven't really moved outside of your state, then maybe think about people you've met who haven't moved outside of your state. Or if you're from a small town in, and you've moved to a city or you've moved around, think about that person you know from that small town that when they say they're from America, what's their idea of America? Do they have an idea of America that really encompasses California to Massachusetts to Seattle to down in New Orleans, do they cover this whole thing or do they just see these as images in their mind or is it like, I've actually been there or I actually think this is part of me, let alone North Africa, I mean North America, let alone part of the Americas, let alone the Western Hemisphere, let alone the entire globe, how do they actually hold these things? So when you talk about the, they're talking about the country's Soviet liberation here, it's in the quotation marks because that also started a whole lot of, um, the, the influence of communism and things like that came into China at that time and it's still being felt the after effects of that with Mao Zedong coming in after. Was that during the time? Was Mao Zedong during that time? Okay, so I'm forgetting. Um, I need to double check with the thing. But just the, the way these things are connected, how these people come in, they do one thing or the other, and that happens and brings in here. And then this person comes in and does this, and this person. That butterfly effect, that connection has been there. So whether we know about it or not, whether we feel it in our day-to-day -day lives, we are already connected on that global scale. So you might just think, oh, these people just started this out of the blue because of this and this. But no, they started that because they were weakened by this and this person came in and took advantage and this person was trying to attempt to get them out of a positive place and this person who happened to be better than what they were going through came in and then they said, okay, we're so tired and disheveled from this thing that now we're going to adopt this because it is better than what we've had in the past. And then for some reason, some other, they don't look past that and they get stuck in that. And there's, there's many different ways for these to happen. And I don't know if that was just a digression to avoid reading this horrific article, but back to it. Okay. So and out of all the outages, outrages that Imperial Japan unleashed upon the Chinese people during this brutal occupation, and there were indeed some stunning crimes committed even by World War II standards, Probably none was as gratuitously hateful as the operations of Unit 731, the Japanese Biological Warfare Unit, that somehow plumbed new depths in what was already a near-genocidal war. Despite innocent beginnings as a research and public health agency, Unit 731 eventually grew into an assembly line for weaponized diseases 
that if fully deployed, could have killed everyone on Earth several times over. All this progress was of course built on the timeless, on the limitless, on the limitless suffering of human prisoners who were held as test subjects and walking disease incubators until Unit 731 disbanded at the end of the war. In a long list of atrocities, these six programs in particular stand out in the bloody history of Unit 731. Okay, now we're going to go into some of the things and... Yeah. Okay, Unit, 7 th Unit 731 experiments, frostbite testing, and um, here you have a picture of the frostbitten hands of a Chinese person who was taken outside in, in the winter by Unit 731 personnel for an experiment on how to best treat frostbite. Date unspecified, it's just a close-up on the hands. They're just swollen up, or dark, although there's different, it's black and white picture, but when you have frostbite, your skin normally gets darker, purple, the blood is freezing, and it's not oxygenated, and looks bruised up. But there also are different skin tones and stuff there, but um, yeah, okay. Yoshimuro Hisato, a physiologist assigned to Unit 731, took a special interest in hypothermia. As part of Murata's study in limb injuries, Hisato routinely submerged prisoners' limbs in a tub of water filled with ice and had them held until the arm or leg had frozen solid and a coat of ice had formed over the skin. According to one eyewitness account, the limbs made a sound like a plank of wood when struck with a cane. Hisato then tried different methods for rapid rewarming of the frozen, frozen appendage. Sometimes he did this by dousing the limb with hot water, sometimes by holding it close to an open fire, and other times by leaving the subject untreated overnight to see how long it took for the person's own body to thaw out. One creepy thing about some of this is there's some tests that were done here that they probably are medical advancements being done now, being used now, just like the still animal testing and things like that going, I'm team human. I will take an animal having to go through something if it means we're going to save some humans, but to a such an extent, of course. I mean, I'm not just saying just willy-nilly, just go put animals through brutal things. But like I said here, there was that aspect of we were divided enough as a human species to think that other human is less like less on my level that I can treat them to this to this kind of thing. I can put them at that subhuman, that sub animal level where it's just the testing subject. And I think we're going to get to points where now computers might be powerful enough to actually simulate a human body to the point where you don't necessarily have to do these or biological functions to simulate those to points where you don't have to actually do it with a human, with a live actual being. Or in other cases, you can actually do the things where you can take stem cells. I know I, I was living with somebody when I was in, studying in Turin, in Italy, and they were doing a study where they said they took a, the sack of a, of a, of a mouse's uh, liver, or was it a kidney, and hollowed it out. And they took the stem cells from the mouse and put them back in. And it regrew the insides of it after an extended amount of time. Of course, they were feeding it nutrients and things like that. So there might be ways to actually grow certain body parts, certain uh, cardiovascular systems and run tests on them without having to have an actual brain and sentient animal in it. Or now we're going to get to points where there's going to be more questionable things of, and this again is stuff that I said I have a very, I'm, I'm very into um, anime and manga and some of these concepts going into anime and manga. It's helped me with a lot of storytelling and things like that, although these are also told in Western stories. But anyway, uh, there might be a situation where you're saying now, can you grow an entire human being that doesn't have a brain, whose brain is actually just being ran and tied into something else. So they're technically not sentient, but you can t run all these tests on them and you're not actually hurting the person, quote unquote. It, could you say that's now like um, considered okay to do tests on that? It's, is that humane in the, in the sense that they say? Okay, um, so yeah, what would you do if um, some ibis cranes are flying by? But anyway, if you had the hibiscus, yeah, hibiscus, 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 something. Anyway, but if you have the situation where it's um, your mom, your sister, your loved one, your wife, your kids can be saved from some actual studies and tests that were done on these people, these prisoners, would you be against that? I mean, I think most people would still want the actual medicine and want the actual procedure to be done on them 
or to save that loved one because it's already in the past. But I think most people would not say it right now to say, oh, yes, torture those 10 prisoners in order to find out how to save my wife. I, I think most people would not be happy with that. And most ill people would also not be happy with if they found out that a loved one or somebody else had put allowed for or put other people through that for them. But yeah. Okay, so uh, next section. That was just the first one. So this is going to be... Uh, okay. Oh, man. Uh, vivisection of conscious prisoners. Here's a picture of a uh, black and white picture. Low quality, thankfully, in, in a sense. Although this low quality gives its own macabre sense of it. In and of itself. Um, uh, a year 731 doctor operates on a patient that is part of a bacteriological experiment, date unspecified. Okay, scroll up, get that picture off the screen. Um, unit 731 started out as a research unit investigating the effects of disease and injury on the fighting ability of an armed force. One element of the unit, called Murata, took this research a little further than the usual bounds of medical ethics by observing injuries and the course of disease on living patients. At first, these patients were volunteers in the ranks of the army, but as the experiments reached the limits of what could possibly be non-invasively observed, and as the supply of volunteers dried up, the unit turned to the study of Chinese POWs and civilian prisoners. And as the concept of consent went out of the window, so did the restraint of the researchers. In what was, in what was around this time, uh, it was around this time that Unit 731 began referring to confined research subjects as logs, or murata, in Japanese. Study methods in these experiments were barbaric. Vivisection, for example, is a practice of mutilating human bodies without anesthesia to study the operations of living systems. Thousands of men and women, mostly Chinese communist prisoners, as well as children, elderly farmers, and elderly farmers, were infected with diseases such as cholera and the plague, then had their organs removed for examination before they died in order to study the effects of the disease without the decomposition that occurs after death. Subject had limbs amputated and reattached to the other side of the body, while others had their limbs crushed or frozen, or had the circulation cut off to observe the progress of gangrene. Finally, when a prisoner's body was all used up, they would typically be shot or killed by lethal injection. The some may have been buried alive. None of the Chinese, Mongolian, Korean, or Russian prisoners assigned to, to Unit 731 survived their confinement. So, as you see, this was a horrific thing, and again, um, it was in the situation, it was, it was war. Uh, it started with a few people doing it, and then it started with the volunteers, and then started getting the prisoners in there as the war goes on. That whole slippery slope thing, you know, you start doing one thing and then it leads to another, and then next you just look around and you just find yourself in just a really horrible situation. And that's why I'm glad to have found something like the non-aggression principle, and I'm using that to kind of guide my, the way I approach my reality tunnel and deal with people. And this is all just non-aggression non principle violations all over the place. Just um, Okay, uh, continue, continue the reading. Weapons tests. I, um, hmm. Okay, so the picture is a Japanese soldier uses a Chinese, a Chinese man's body for a bayonet practice near Tianjin, China, September 1937. This is 1937. Um, it's like 80 years ago. Like I said, there's, there's people still alive that were alive while this was going on. Uh, there's a chance they could have been people who were working at, who were here. Maybe the cameraman who took this could have just been a young Japanese man who was sent to Unit 731, just, or he might have just been around the war doing different things, and then Unit 7, Unit 19, sorry. And then he was somewhere in Tianjin, China, and said, oh, we need a cameraman to test this out. Do you want to come? And then he just went, and then he goes there and he sees this Chinese man strapped up to this, I don't know, it's Chinese man's body. So they say body. Like, hopefully the person is dead, but they have something covering their eyes. 
So maybe they're dead, maybe they're not, but they strapped up on something and then the guy takes a picture and then he might be part of Union 73. This could have just been one picture he took and he never talked about it again. But this person could still be very well be alive walking around Japan. I guess he'd be in advanced age right now if he was maybe 15 when this happened. He could be 90 something, but... We've come, we've come far. So anyone who, does, who says the good old days of history are, what good old days? What good old days are you talking about? Just tell me, what good old days are you talking about? You don't know anything about history if you think these good old days are such days that you want to go back in. Okay. So this was weapons tests. The effectiveness of various weapons was of obvious interest to the Japanese army to determine of the Japanese army. To determine effectiveness, Unit 731 herded prisoners together on a firing range and blasted them from varying ranges by multiple Japanese weapons, such as the Nambu 8mm pistol, bolt-action rifles, machine guns, and grenades. Wound patterns and penetration depths were then compared on the bodies of the dead and dying inmates. Bayonets, swords, and knives were also studied in this way. Though the prisoners were usually bound for these tests, Flamethrowers were also tested on both covered and exposed skin. In addition, gas chambers were set up as set up at unit facilities and test subjects exposed to nerve gas and blister agents. Heavy objects were dropped onto bound prisoners to crush to study crush injuries. Subjects were locked up and deprived of food and water to learn how long humans could survive without them, and victims were allowed to drink only seawater or were given injections of mismatched human or animal blood to study transfusions and the clotting processes. Meanwhile, prolonged X-ray exposure sterilized and killed thousands of research participants, as well as inflicting horrible burns when the emitting uh, plates were miscalibrated or held too close to the subject's nipples, genitals, and faces. And to study the effects of high G-forces on pilots and fa falling uh, paratroopers, Unit 731 personnel loaded human beings into large centrifuges and spun them at higher and higher speeds until they lost consciousness and or died, which usually happened around 10 to 15 Gs, though young children showed a lower tolerance for acceleration forces. So yeah. Um, young children showed lower tolerance, so, I mean, this whole thing where kids are more pliable when they fall and things like that and break a bone, you heal faster, but just having that in there means, yeah, they, they tested these things on young children too. And I guess you could, I can, I can try and imagine what people must have been thinking, what the, and they might have been many Japanese soldiers that technically had a better chance of living through the war due to some of the things that Unit 731 did. Maybe they gave them better weapons or had better ways to heal the injuries they received during these situations and knew what to do in certain places and times, but this is some horrific stuff. Um, need a quick pause just to turn on the light here. Okay, so back to the reading. I must turn on the light. Move the setup a bit so it wasn't backlit with it in the position I was in before. Okay, so three more to go. Slipless experiments. Here we have a picture of General Shiro, Shiro Ishil, the commander of 731, or Unit 731, from Wikimedia, Wikipedia Commons. Okay, venereal disease had been, had been the bane of organized militaries since ancient Egypt, and so it stands to reason that the Japanese military would take an interest in the symptoms and treatments of syphilis. To learn what they needed to know, doctors assigned to Unit 731 infected prisoners with the disease and withheld treatment to observe the uninterrupted courses, course of the illness. A contemporary treatment, a primitive chemotherapy agent called Salvarsan, was sometimes administered over a period of months to observe the side effects, however. To ensure effective transmission of the disease, Syphilitic male prisoners were ordered to rape both female and male fellow prisoners, who would then be monitored to observe the onset of the disease. If the first exposure failed to establish infection, more rapes would be arranged until it did. 
Okay, so, yeah. Started off with just a picture of a guy, and you're like, okay, maybe they're not going to get as gruesome in this stage. It's syphilis. Uh, I mean, I don't really know what syphilis does, but you know, it's not a good thing. It's not something you want to have, let alone have after being raped repeatedly in order to be tempted to be infected with it. So this is this some utter horrific things, and it's... I mean, what, what, what do you say to things like this? What, what, what's, what really goes on? You, I can kind of understand why people want this to be out, but this happens. If you go into this collective kind of idea, it's in-group, out-group, us versus them, it can go to this. It can be this as well. This can happen. If you have this whole idea that we are better, and I mean, you think about the system that was there. They, most Japanese people at that time, literally thought that the emperor was a god on earth, was a supernatural being on earth. It was a higher being, and it was taken from the stock of the Japanese people. So if the, that higher being had given them that consent or that allowance to do this to other humans, even they were the selected group of humans, a special group, you know, the selected few out of the masses, and then their god king would tell them, or god emperor would tell them, this is what you have to do. That's God, mm -hmm. God Emperor, like the whole like Trump situation, but um, I don't want to mention that in this situation because that's done as a meme, but this was literally, and that's the thing. Right now we've taken something like God Emperor as a meme, as something for the laws, but that was literally what they thought of him as. It was literally, this is a God that is also the Emperor of Japan. And as being a God, this God is going to put us at the highest of high and have us be victorious, even though we have to do these other things and these other subhuman beings in order to do this. Now, what I was mentioning before with some of this, there might actually be some studies and some things done to fight syphilis during this process. But then how do you feel if you find out that it was done in this manner? And this this whole idea that people... I know we have a fear of death because we don't know what's after. It's unknown. It's like, what happens? I mean, you might claim to know with whatever faith and belief system that you have, but... I don't think it's possible to know. I don't know what happens after. I have some thoughts. I think nothing happens after. Just like it was pretty much just like before I was born. I wasn't here and it wasn't on my mind. <laughs> it wasn't a mind to have. After I die, there won't be a mind to have the lack of being alive. So that's kind of how I think about that. But there are worse things than death. Of course, of how you die is one thing. But here you are going to die. And then before that dying... Multiple rapes and infection with syphilis. Um, and it's, just, it's a mess for everyone involved. It's a mess for the person being forced to rape other people. It's, it's, it's sickening. Um, yeah. Okay, so you need to stay with the topic, I guess. Rape and forced pregnancy is the next one. You need 731's Harbin facility. This is, this is a place we're still there. You know, this is a place if. If there ever was a place that was haunted, you just go here and just test it. But I, I don't think there's sufficient evidence to believe in that either. But um, if there were places, there would be candidates to actually do that testing. All right, okay. Anyway. Um, beyond just the syphilis experiments, rape became a common feature of Unit 731's experiments. And there's a link here. So in this article, there is links. So these, these are things that have been talked about, and if you want... You can check out this article. It's all that interesting.com slash unit seven thirty one unit dash seven thirty one, and I'll try to leave links uh, where you can go check this out. And you, if you feel like checking out more, you can also go to the links that are cited here. Okay, so for example, female prisoners of childbearing age were sometimes forcibly impregnated so that weapon and trauma experiments could be done on them. After being infected with various diseases, exposed to chemical weapons on, or suffering crush injuries, bullet wounds, and shrapnel injuries, the pregnant subjects were opened up and the effects on the fetuses studied. The idea seemed to have been to translate the team's findings into civilian medicine, but if Unit 731's researchers ever publish these results, the papers seem not to have survived the warriors. And yeah, that's what I'd been mentioning before, how some of this was could ostensibly be like, hey, we're doing this to protect our soldiers and our civilians because we can find out information from these things. 
and even let's say there actually was a situation where some of the material was used actually to help. I think this might have just been a rationalization, part of the rationalization for the people doing it to continue doing these things because the levels of things that people will do just because it's something somebody has told them and given them some kind of... It's never a good reason to do something just because you can. Because you can pretty much do anything at any time. But just being able to do it isn't a good enough reason. You need more reasons. Don't believe something is right to do just because somebody told you. I mean, it's good to ask, why am I doing this? Is this actually right? What evidence do you have that this is actually a good thing to do? Who am I doing this to? Like, these are things that some people don't ask, and people will find all sorts of reasons and rationalizations to not ask these questions. If someone wants you to do something for them, there's many ways they can get you to kind of avoid or not actually, or not actually ask these questions. Find different things. They can know what you're thinking. Oh, maybe if I put this and this out there and that and that, and then the person will... But yeah, so um, if it was used, I don't think they'd want to admit that this is where it came from. Next, germ warfare. So here we have some kids. Uh, we have some kids in the picture. Unit 731's researchers conduct bacteriological experiments with captive child with a captive child subjects in Nongan County of the Northeast China's Jilin Province. November 1940. The totality of Unit 731's 731's research was in support of a larger mission, which by 1931 was to develop horrific weapons of mass destruction for use against the Chinese population and presumably American and Soviet forces if the time ever came. To this end, Unit 731 cycled through tens of thousands of prisoners at several facilities across Manchuria, which had been occupied by Imperial forces for years. Inmates of these facilities were infected with several of the most lethal pathogens known to science, such as Yersinia pestisis, or no, Yersinia pestis, which causes bubonic and pneumonic plague, and typhus, which the Japanese hoped would spread from person to person after being deployed and depopulate disputed areas. To breed the most lethal strains possible, doctors monitored patients for rapid onset of symptoms and quick progression. Prisoners who pulled through were shot, but those who got sick, sickest fastest were bled to death on a mortuary table and their blood was used to transfect other prisoners, the sickest of whom would themselves be bled to transfer the most virulent strain to yet another generation. One member of the Unit 731 later recalled that very sick and unresting prisoners would be laid out on the slab so a line could be inserted into their cartilage artery. When most of the blood had been siphoned out and the heart was too weak to pump anymore, an officer in leather boots climbed onto the table and jumped on the victim's chest with enough force to crush their ribcage, whereupon another dollop of blood would spurt into the container. When the plague bacillus had been bred to what was felt to be a sufficiently lethal caliber, the last generation of prisoners to be infected were exposed for, to a huge number of fleas. Why pestis again? White pestis preferred vector of white pestis's preferred vector of contagion. The fleas were then packed in dust and sealed inside clay bomb casings. Here you have another picture of Japanese personnel in protective suits carry a stretcher through Yiwu, China, during the Unit 731's germ warfare tests during June 1972. On October 4th, 1940, Japanese bombers deployed these casings, which loaded over 30,000 fleas, each loaded with over 30,000 fleas, with 30,000 fleas, that had, been, that had each sucked blood from a dying prisoner over the Chinese village of Kuzhou. Witnesses of the raid recall a fine reddish dust settling on surfaces all over town, followed by a rash of painful flea bites that afflicted nearly everyone. From contemporary accounts, it is known that more than 2,000 civilians died of plague following this attack, and that over 1,000 or so died in nearby Yiwu after the plague was carried there by sick railway workers. Other attacks, including anthrax, killed approximately 6,000 more people in the area. In August 1945, after Hiroshima and Nagasaki had been had 
both been bombed. The Soviet army had invaded Manchuria and utterly in annihilated the Japanese army, and the emperor read his infamous surrender declaration over the radio. Unit 731 was officially disbanded. Its records were mostly burned, destroying any useful information the team had managed to generate in 13 years of research. Researchers mostly slipped back into civilian life in occupied Japan as if nothing had ever happened, many of them becoming prominent members of university for uh, faculty. To this day, Japan has not apologized for, and China has not forgiven, the countless atrocities Japanese force, forces visited upon China between 1931 and 1945. The last witness to this history grow old. The last witnesses at as the last witnesses to this history grow old and die, it's possible that the matter will never be addressed again. And here's a postword. Or afterward. After this look at Unit 731, read up on some of the worst war crimes ever committed, as well as other Japanese war crimes for World War II era, and then have a look at four of the most evil science experiments ever performed, and find out whether or not any of the highly disturbing Nazi research actually contributed anything to medical science. So I might come back and read more articles on that. Is with this series, it's just things that I, I've read or want to read. If I find a new article I want to read, I kind of go it and read it, and I'm going to read it anyway, so I might as well do it audible. I think we evolved in a sense where we were used to telling stories by voice and for some people like me also, it's I might not have certain time to actually read things. I Sometimes I prefer hearing like audiobooks and podcasts and things like that. You know, I put them on 1.5 or 2 times speed just to get the information in faster as I'm doing other things. So I'm figuring if I do take the time off to actually read something, might as well read it out loud. Also reading it out loud in some cases, you see it to the eyes, you're reading it, you're thinking about it it gets the information into your head, I think, stronger than just doing one or the other. But anyway, so that process is just a way to share some of these things with you. And this is a story that I've thought of reading something on Union 731 for a couple of years and always feeling like, uh, is this a topic that I want on my channel? Is this a topic I want out there? It's just such a horrific, dark aspect of humanity. But it's, it's part of us too. It's part of what we can do. We are just animals. This is just... The whole sense that the world is the way that it is right now. Some people do despair at some of the things going on and think this is a horrible time, but this to me is the best time to be alive that I have known about. It's just, we have so much to lose right now that I think it's it's good to be aware of these things and realize how bad it can be, how bad we have been, how bad some of the things can get that we should be thankful. Like these people in that village, they could have been a war going on. They could have just been relatively unknown of not knowing what it is and then these bombs, these planes fly over and these bombs start dropping, or let's say they knew there was a war going on. What they had known before about bombs was fire and things like that. So that falls down and they think, oh, oh what, the, the bombs didn't go off. Maybe it's not that bad. No, it's just red dust and it's nothing. And then the flea bites, they're probably used to fleas because there might be fleas in that area. And, and, and then the disease sets in and it's... It's... It's, it's tough to think of, of, of what, what people can do to each other. Um, but then there's also amazing things people can do to each other, you know. And this is the thing, we, we kind of, I think we kind of forget that. We kind of um, for, forget the sense that it's not just because some Japanese people were doing this, they did it to some Chinese people. We might feel that China is doing this to Americans, so we need to do this way. We might feel like, oh, we have been held back by these other groups, so we need to react in this way. And then when it comes down here, when it's saying, okay, the Japanese forces have, have not have apologized, but who's going to apologize? Should we go and get the people who actually did it, who are just living their regular life and get them to apologize? And who do they apologize to? Do they just apologize to Chinese people in general, some who were not born, some who might have been grown up and living in China who disagree with the same institution that said this? Did every Chinese person come out and say, we're going to go to war with Japan? Did every Japanese person declare like, we're going to be at war with China, or was it a few people who had these delusions of grandeur, who had these positions of power and thought that we are no better than you. We have this higher mandate than you do, and we can decide to do this, and then now it involves all these other people. And it's just, it's just a whole mess of a thing. Um, 
let me know if you'd heard about this thing before and let me know what you guys think. I'm going to leave a link. Like I said, it's all that's interesting.com slash units dash 731 if you want to get this article and read it for yourself and get the links that are with it. I am going to stop now. <laughs> and uh, yeah, this article was as bad as I thought it was going to be. Uh, reading it through was, was gruesome, but I think I'm glad I did it. Um, had some apprehension during it, but uh, let, let me know what you guys thought. Goodbye. <laughs>